Aloha, everyone, and thank you for joining this session of the Hawaii Book and Music uh, Festival, which is uh, being held entirely online. And today we have the pleasure of uh, speaking with uh, Tom Kaufman, who has uh, written a new book called Inclusion. It is not out yet. It will probably uh, be available at the end of November, but uh, this is a, a major a piece of work on the history of Hawaii, especially as it relates to uh, Japanese and Japanese Americans during the uh, Second World War. So welcome, Tom. Uh, re really looking forward to our conversation uh, here. Um, in, uh, you know, Tom will explain uh, who some of these main characters are. Actually, I mean, I will, I will ask him to, but one of the main characters is a guy named uh, Shigeo Yoshida, who unfortunately is not, uh, not that well known, but uh, he played an uh, incredible important uh, role in this uh, story. And in John Tsukano's uh, book uh, called Bridge of Love, he uh, quotes Shigeo Yoshida as saying that the war was a blessing in disguise for Hawaii because it led to an acceleration of racial integration. Um, I I appreciate the idea of starting with Shigeo Yoshida um, because the book is in a way about the figures who were in deep in the background, but uh, really influenced the course of the events. And I think above all, Shigeo met that uh, description. Um, he was a young man from Hilo, uh, he, a uh, son of an immigrant uh, couple, interestingly. Um, his father was a uh, displaced samurai, one of the many displaced samurai who ended up in Hawaii. And um, uh, he evolved as a uh, brilliant student, brilliant debater, uh, came to, was, was the best debater in the territory of Hawaii and his time. And that was a, a time when debate was a big thing. Uh, came to UH, uh, sort of took the UH debate scene by storm. And in the process became friends with Hung Wai Ching who was uh, sort of the big man on campus of the time, an extraordinary figure who became his partner in this wartime scenario. And together they came to the attention of Charles Hemingway, who's another figure who's been largely forgotten, unfortunately. Uh, we do have Hemingway Hall at the University of Hawaii campus is the closest to his being remembered, but he's not remembered adequately. Um, I think among those three, um, they were like the, the nucleus of starting what became a resistance to what became America's horrendous policy of exclusion and incarceration. Um, another really significant actor was John A. Burns. Uh, Governor John A. Burns, legendary political figure. Uh, John A. Burns was the person who first told me this story, told me the storyline, spelled Yoshida's name for me. And it was over the course of hours of conversation. Um, and it struck me that this was the inner story of how Hawaii so remarkably had, uh, as a community, survived the war and actually came out of the war stronger. And that was sort of the starting point from which I began exploring all the ramifications of that and the interactions with uh, the federal government, particularly with the War Department and its determination to 
do a mass uh, incarceration in Hawaii. And with the President of the United States, Franklin D. Roosevelt, who was dead set on basically removing uh, tens and tens of thousands of people of Japanese ancestry from Hawaii in a mass, in a mass internment. So that was my point of departure and it became a history that went in a lot of directions, but there was always this core of a strategy in which inclusion uh, mattered most. The strategy was include as many people as possible, uh, resist, mass incarceration, resist exclusion. So the binary was inclusion, exclusion. Now there's, you know, in this um, dichotomy between uh, plantation and, uh, and, and, and city, uh, your, your story of the people who are fighting for inclusion, um, you know, uh, centers on, on a, a group, uh, you know, surprisingly a small group, although their influence was large, a small group of, uh, of people who are uh, city folks, you know, they're well educated, they go to McKinley, they go to um, UH, they become debate champions and, uh, and so on. Whereas the plantations uh, were still uh, segregated, the living uh, parts, of the camps at any rate were still segregated by uh, race and people retained a pretty strong sense of their uh, ethnic uh, identity. So the other way in which we can look at this binary between plantation and city life is the whole cultural issue of assimilation on the one hand, you know, moving into mainstream American society, becoming, as we would put it today, a banana, you know, yellow on the outside, but white on the inside. Uh, uh, Americanization and these, the people who are pushing for inclusion might be called the uh, Americanizers. Uh, and then on the other hand, there's, there's, there's resistance from uh, some people uh, or what they have to overcome actually is what's already there so strongly in the plantation camps and other uh, communities of Japanese Americans is that sort of cultural identity, you know, no, we're Japanese or, you know, and so how you negotiate. And of course it's an ongoing issue as to how you negotiate your American identity with your Japanese identity or Chinese or whatever other kind of um, identity uh, you have. So in a sense, the uh, assimilationists uh, from the city um, sort of um, won the day, didn't they? I mean, they won the argument that you need to put aside your ethnic identities, your ethnic practices, even some of your ethnic religions like Shinto and you need to embrace the uh, American ideal. So is this a story of the victory of, or the dominance of uh, assimilation in the argument over ethnic identity? Yeah, it is in a sense. I, you know, I, I definitely understand what you're driving at in that question, George. Um, and, you know, I think that there's validity in that observation. It wasn't really the explicit issue of the day, uh, but it was, you know, a dynamic of the day. Um, the, the issue of the day was, how the hell are we going to get through this war? Mm -hmm. And how are we going to do it without being dragged away? Mm -hmm. And um, what is our, stance relative to the American government and the American cause in its war with Japan. And the answers were, uh, we are Americans. Um, the, there's a tremendous distinction that needs to be made in that question and in that conversation between the immigrant generation and the Nisei second generation. Mm -hmm. And the Nisei second generation, like many immigrant generations, had become assimilationists and uh, patriots of, their, of the uh, country that their parents had adopted, right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the luxury of debating 
uh, assimilation, acculturation, Americanization, etc., uh, was you know is kind of a luxury item of, of a later time, I think. Well, wrong as it was, and it was wrong uh, to you know put uh, people in Ono Uli Uli. Um, at least it was based on the idea that you had to target, you know, you had to look into uh, the, the the people's past and try to figure out uh, as as best you can. And again, they were wrong, but still try to make the distinction between those who you would deem disloyal from those who you would deem loyal and the disloyal list got smaller and smaller but at least it's targeted which is very different from the basic assumption of the internment camps on the west coast which is round up everybody and put uh, everybody in so in that sense in a way hono uli uli is a is a better <laughs> if, if, if there can be such a better internment camp as opposed to a worse internment camp. But at least the foundation was one based on trying to make some kind of um, uh, distinction between you know, those who are loyal and those who are not. So uh, I think that we tend to um, uh, lump Hono Uli Uli in with Manzanar and you know, Hot Mountain and so on. You know, all I, don't think it's, I don't think it's uh... quite different and there was a better better idea behind it, even though it was still wrong-headed. Yeah, no, I mean, there were wrong things and unjust things. There's, there's no disputing that. But like, it's instructive that Honolulu Uli was built for 3,000 internees. And uh, at the most, there were, I'm not an expert on this, but three or 400. And the rest of the camp was turned over to housing prisoners of war. Yeah, yeah. So um, that, shows, that shows how policy was changing in motion as, um, as this turnaround was occurring, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, you're, you're a, you, you talk about um, the, formation of the uh, Nisei uh, military unit, initially the 100th Battalion, later on the, the uh, 442nd. Yeah. And your story about how General Emmons' uh, role in it was really quite fascinating, really interesting, because it almost seems like he was on the edge of insubordination, that he actually didn't have authority or clearance to form this unit. But Again, he was he was so uh, convinced that this was the right thing to do, and therefore he did it, and allowed the uh, 100th Battalion to uh, to come into existence, even though he didn't have uh, full uh, approval uh, from uh, from Washington. So um, he, he, here again, it seems to me that Emmons is an example of a Goliath who is helping the Davids, because yeah. you know, like, like McCloy in, in his uh, second version of himself. Uh, the converted version of McCloy really came to uh, to uh, help the uh, the cause of uh, inclusion. Um, I, to, to my knowledge, that this story of, of General Emmons acting against uh, not exactly against orders, but without full authorization, is is a new tale. I, I think you've uncovered something new about him, haven't you? Uh, I haven't. I, I think I developed it in a lot more detail, mm -hmm. uh, but it, it is not brand new. No, it's, it was interesting. Um, um, Brian Nia, who's mm -hmm. a researcher, and Noel Kent, Dr. Noel Kent of the Poli Sci, mm -hmm. and uh, a few other people in the early 1980s when the apology and reparation movement was going on, did some research, and they they made a deep scratch into the subject. And uh, Noel Kent wrote something, a phrase I liked. He said, John McCloy suffered from split-mindedness. Um, I developed, I developed a, a lot of the details, uh, but it wasn't brand new, no. Okay, well, for me it was, and it was quite a striking uh, story as to uh, how um, his own 
Hawaii bred sense of what was right and what was just, you know, overcame the kind of pressure that he was feeling from yeah. uh, Washington. Um, you uh, talk about, uh, in, in your other book, The Island Edge of America, you, you know, you talk about how discussions about uh, what post-war society in Hawaii should be like, you know, started really early. It's, it's amongst the, the, uh, the 100th Battalion, 442nd uh, Nisei soldiers who are in training and, uh, yeah. you know, already they're not even in, the, in, the, in battle yet, but they're also looking forward to after the war and what Hawaiian society would be like. And then you describe a series of really remarkable conferences that were held in the different islands uh, here from 1943 to 1945, involving a, a variety of, uh, of, of participants, all discussing the, their, their visions of what the new uh, post-war uh, society uh, would be like. Uh, could, could you give kind of, um, I know it was a complex and wide ranging discussion, but uh, basically what were the conclusions that they came to? Um, that's really good because it was complex and wide ranging and uh, a lot of them bore into details such as how do we develop housing? How do we um, develop the economy? How do we, um, um pursue uh, our goals but the essential thing is i think process and the process was externalize take our goals and externalize our goals for the whole community mm -hmm. so whatever it is that's on our mind uh, i uh, I'd like to read something here, actually. But, uh, uh, Yoshida was ever wary of ethnic insularity. So Shigeo Yoshida and Hung Wai Ching basically led these conferences. And there were four territory-wide conferences of AJA leaders, Japanese uh, immigrant leaders, and uh, various other community leaders would either come as observers or participants, limited participants. Um, but um, regarding Yoshida, proposed that the participants transform their immediate group concerns into overall community concerns. This would require a realignment and I think this is this really goes to this question of identity and um, who are we? Mm -hmm. Realignment not only of influence and re relationships, but of how Japanese thought of themselves. Mm -hmm. He critiqued ethnic groups as self-absorbed. Interracial cooperation, he said, was the key to community progress. Therefore, the conferees should evaluate all things in terms of their effect on the larger community. Yoshida asked in what ways Japanese could contribute to integrating themselves and in what ways other groups could contribute to an inclusive process. Yeah. So the essential conclusion was to use, I, I think by the end of the war, there was a sense that Japanese were uh, accumulating a potential for really leading Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And uh, the question is, is it for, is it, is it for, um, the good of a, a, a one ethnic group, or is it for the good of everyone? And I think that was where the Democratic Party and the Democratic Revolution uh, came in. And that was where Jack Burns became this pivotal figure in leading the Democratic, leading Japanese Americans into the, to, to the Democratic Party and pursuing a, uh, 
an open society, basically, if you want to use that term. Yeah. Overthrowing the oligarchy, overthrowing the white oligarchy, overthrowing right. the Republican Party. Right. Yeah, overthrowing the white oligarchy, but also overthrowing the sort of ties to their ethnic past. I mean, one of the conclusions I believe uh, you said that came about in this uh, in these uh, conferences was that uh, Japanese language school should be closed. Yeah. You know, why should why should we be learning uh, Japanese? We speak English here in in um, uh, American uh, Hawaii. So once again, is the I, I I may say so the assimilationist uh, argument. You know, we need to be uh, Americans, and so you know, close the uh, the. Let, uh, let, me, let me counter it this way: those who argued for closing the Japanese language schools, I, you know, I'm not endorsing their argument, but they're, they're uh, in the same breath, their argument was for teaching Japanese in the public schools of Hawaii yeah. as a foreign language, a foreign language. And thereby integrate the speaking of, the learning and speaking of Japanese into the American mainstream. Yeah. 